But to be the man, you gotta beat the man, and I'm saying, woo! We're gonna play football, yippee! The CFB on OSG with your host, the Online Sports Guys. Thank you, Tommy Palmer, and welcome to the OSG on CFB, the CFB on OSG. Uh, Choice D, all the above. Take your pick. It's the show at the beginning of the week, which makes it sound like the old XFL championship game. (laughs) And the three of us are actually here all in one place. And the video file is going to be a bitch to render, and that's going to happen probably later Monday, early Tuesday. He's because it'll, take, because it'll take me all day to do it. Right. He's at OSG Phil. He's Jay Wilkerson 16. I'm at OSG Nelson. And we are all here in place to kind of take a peek at what went down in the, the world of college football this week. Thanks for accessing us, however you are doing so, whether it is at theonlinesportsguys.com, on our YouTube channel, on the video side, on Facebook, on Twitter, or on the OSG Sports app. Yeah, all of those, by the way, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, all at OSG Sports. Right. So here's here's key. Let's see, here we go. Here's the Android version of the OSG Sports app. Just dialing it up right here. So I think Phil's going to show the Android version here on the TV side. No, I'm going to actually show, um, once I can find it, I'm going to show the iTunes version. There you go. All right, so he's got the iTunes version. I have the Android version showing up, and I think Wilkie's trying to find his. There's his, so there you go. It's proof it exists. All the content that is not soccer shows up on the OSG sports side. It's wrestling, it's self-help, it's uh, college football, a lot of college football, and Wilkie before... See, there it is. It actually functions. There's the commercials. (laughs) Before we get into the show this week, Wilkie, let me talk to you a little bit about your recent sojourns on the debrief Corey McCartney was able to visit you got to hang out and uh, catch up on some yes, Good stuff. And, and you got to catch up with Lars Anderson about Nebraska about Tom Block about Florida State what's been going on with the debrief these days you guys have been hitting some quality topics and on the video side I'm filling until he gets back up on the screen front and center so I can actually see him there we go so what's it been like doing the debrief the last couple of weeks oh no he froze again <laughs> he moved I do that build up <laughs> and I get that <laughs> I get uh, that. Unfortunately, for those of you on the podcasting audio side, you're not seeing this, but it is kind of funny because every few minutes, whenever Brother Wilkie moves a little bit to one direction or the other, the screen freezes. Yes, yeah, so you're seeing him frozen until he dials back out, then dials back in, and we're going to have this as a part of the comedy of this particular show <laughs> this week. <laughs> on the video side, of course. Yes, and so we'll I talk... Maybe we should have him talk about the Blue Blood stuff when he comes back. But in the meantime, I think so. we'll get to the topic at hand. Yeah, let's get to the topic at hand. And it was uh, uh, a busy week for a lot of bad news with some uh, with some quality individuals passing. And it goes to Mr. Two Bits at the University of Florida. It goes to uh, a junior linebacker at the University of Hawaii. It goes to Tyshawn Dye, who was a running back at Clemson in East Carolina, who unfortunately passed in a drowning. But obviously, Phil, biggest story of the week goes with Jared Lorenzen from the University of Kentucky. Yeah, and if you don't know who Jared Lorenzen is, I really, really recommend you look him up on the Google or even on YouTube. Um, Because he was more so than probably any other college uh, football player in recent memory. He probably was one of the most unique college football players that you will ever have seen play football. And the reason he was unique, believe it or not, he's probably the largest man to ever play quarterback in a a Division I SEC-level college football game. Yeah. Um, And for all the questions about he's – he doesn't look like a quarterback. He's too big to be a quarterback. The kid could play. Yeah. 
and It'll... you saw that with the University of Kentucky and the the round mound of touchdown, Wilkie. That's where we are right now, and just discussing the 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 legacy of Jared Lorenzen passed at the age of thirty eight, and I know it was a shock to a lot of us. It was, and um, you know he got the the uh, moniker Hefty Lefty for a good reason. Uh, yeah, he was large and in charge when he was out there for Kentucky. <laughs> um, but, you know, what? when I was thinking about, uh, when I heard the news about Jared Lorenzen and his passing, the, the first thing I thought about is, in, in some ways, he kind of changed the position of quarterback. And now you see these quarterbacks that are built like linebackers. I remember having this conversation with Dino Babers at Syracuse last year, that coach at Syracuse about how he likes his quarterbacks to be built like linebackers, 250, um, 245 range, maybe 255, that, that uh, can take some punishment. And that was the thing about Jared Lorenzen. When defensive ends came around, uh, well, they were kind of meeting their match uh, with uh, Lorenzen uh, standing up there. But now you're starting to see quarterbacks. I'm trying to think of the guy at Virginia Tech. Uh, back in 2011, 2012, uh, that ended up um, being a, a tight end in the NFL. Oh, um, uh, Thomas. Yeah, yeah, Thomas, yes. Um, I can't forget. Oh, Tyrod Thomas. No, not Tyrod. No. Not Tyrod, no, Tyrod Taylor. Taylor. Sorry, Tyrod Taylor. Taylor. I think that was before Tyrod. Anyway, um, Logan Thomas. That's Logan it. Thomas, there he goes. Um, he, he was the, really the, the next in line. With uh, from Jared Lorenzen as far as quarterbacks with some size, and now you're seeing more and more quarterbacks that have some uh, size to them. And I think you could trace that back to Jared Lorenzen. Uh, I think um, now he was more of a drop back passer, of course, uh, but when he did tuck and run, he was he was a load to bring down. And uh, you know, I I think as time passes, I think that should be the marker right there of the. Uh, Jerry Lorenzen should be that marker of the uh, quarterbacks that have some size to them and and uh, and being effective. Uh, so and he was effective as a quarterback, uh, and uh, of course he went on to the Giants as a backup. Uh, but I think he was kind of changed kind of the model a little bit. He was kind of like the test uh, of changing the, the body shape of, of a quarterback. And now you see these quarterbacks, especially when they have to run the, the uh, run pass option. Now they've got to have some size to them to be able to withstand some of the punishment because you remember the wishbone quarterbacks of Oklahoma and, and all the, uh, option quarterbacks back in the seventies and eighties, they weren't that large, but they were very shifty. Well, now you're getting guys that have some shiftiness to him, but have some size to withstand the punishment. I think the marker was probably with Jared Lorenzen. And Phil, the story with Lorenzen goes that uh, Rich Brooks, I think when he was interviewed and discussing the, the passing uh, of Lorenzen, he was at 300 pounds and then they tried to get him on something of a diet and conditioning program. They had him down to 260. Then he goes away for a vacation, uh, goes away from campus. I think he went back home came back at over 300 again, and then University of Kentucky was like, yeah, okay, we get it, we get it. We're not going to try this anymore, uh, try to knock another 40 pounds off of him because he's always going to come back at more than three spins. All-time leader in passing yards, all-time leader in completions, all-time leader in total offense at 10,637 yards, Phil. It, he, was a, he was a fun watch, and if you look past the novelty of it, the fact that, yeah, he was three spins, to Wilkie's point, he, he blew up the archetype the archetype of a quarterback. Heck, the kid threw for 10,000-plus yards as a college quarterback and played all four yeah. seasons from 2000 to 2000 through 2003. He had some game. Mm -hmm. There's no question he had some skill and ability, and he let, he led Kentucky to some success over that period of time. <coughs> there you go. Yeah, no problem. Um, he struggled a little bit as a freshman, as freshmen are wont to do. But look at the numbers. Uh, he threw for 3,600 yards as a freshman. However, he also threw for 19 TDs and 21 interceptions, which might be an issue. He got that <laughs> under control, and he had enough skill that he got drafted. He Well, he didn't get drafted. He signed as an undrafted free agent with the New York Giants, and he made the team. Yeah, as a backup. Mm -hmm. And, uh, again – he, he, you're right, Phil. He had some game to him. Uh, but to me, when I think of Jared Lorenzen, I think of how he kind of broke the mold of what a quarterback should look like. And 
now we're seeing all these quarterbacks that are at the at, that are weights of of a, of a linebacker. And I think it all can be traced back to Jared Lorenz. And I think coaches were taking notes about have, how, having a quarterback at that size. Now, maybe around 290, 280, that might be a little too big. But when you're a defensive end coming around the corner, guy a little bigger than you, um, yeah, he's, he's a load to bring down. But, I, you know, I, I just think he kind of changed the way people thought about the body type of quarterbacks. And uh, I think that's what you're seeing now with some of these larger, uh, I mean, l- really built quarterbacks now uh, in college football. Next up on the list, uh, a couple of stories in and around USC, one from USC's past and one from USC's near past, which is kind of close to their present. <laughs> Guys, in the past couple of weeks, we've talked about Coaches who are no longer head coaches who go through the the Nick Saban rehabilitation internship program and they just they'll they'll end up at certain places this year. Terry Bowden is going to be taking, I think he's pursuing a master's or taking it for credit or something like that when it comes to his new gig at Clemson. So Wilkie, you look at LSU and they've hired former USC, former LA Ram, former UNLV coach, John Robinson as, and I'm going to use air quotes here on the, on the video side, mm-hmm. a senior consultant to Coach O. This was announced by a Mark Slabaugh article that came out early last week. Yeah, um, and I, I wonder if he's being paid accordingly. Um, <laughs> but, Pass, fail. <laughs> you know, I, I think this is a, a good move by Ed Orgeron. Uh, to look at someone like John Robinson, who still is involved in the game. And uh, he, he had some excellent teams at Southern Cal, uh, really good offensive teams there. And he translated that into the NFL with the, with the LA Rams. Uh, but I, I think the, the weak link has always been with the LSU, the offense, and any kind of consistency with, with their offense. They have the athletes, they got players, but – Scheme wise, you're, you're you're kind of you're kind of scratching your head sometimes, uh, but I think they feel like they've got a quarterback in place and Joe Burrow. Uh, they get the running backs in place, and they need some kind of seasoned veteran of offensive football, someone who's still connected to the game. I think uh, bringing John Robinson as as a consultant, uh, I think will pay dividends uh, for LSU. The part of the statement from Coach O'Phil, I want to welcome Coach Robinson and his wife, Miss Beverly, to the LSU family, great friend and mentor, a very valuable resource for us in growing our championship culture at LSU, inducted into the College Hall of Fame a decade ago. Uh, Coach Robinson, otherwise known as RoboFat on the Jim Rome Show, 83 years young, and he's going to be a special consultant. Yeah, it can't hurt. I mean, he and or he and Coach O have a history. They they dating back years. Oh yeah. And, and o, Coach O considers Robinson really a mentor for him. So why not? If if Coach if Coach Robinson's willing to spend some time in Baton Rouge in the fall and kind of get oversee what oversee or just kind of keep an eye on what's going on with the team on both levels and help or. Can help Coach O kind of keep the ship running the way he wants it to run? Why not? What is well, that? Well, I, I think uh, John Robinson is going to be more – I guess he still lives in Southern California. I think he's going to stay there and watch games and, vi- and video conference like we're doing right now yeah. uh, with, with Coach O. Uh, but, you know, again, John Robinson's kind of, a, as you alluded to, kind of a mentor uh, to uh, Ed Orgeron. And, uh, you know, I've always thought – you know, he's still connected to the game. He's still engaged in the game, even at 83. And how college football has evolved since when he, when he was the coach at Southern Cal. But he's been able to kind of evolve with it. I mean, he, he still keeps up with it. And I think this is a good move. I think it's great for John Robinson because now he has a sense of purpose now uh, as he stays connected to the game. Now he's got a little bit of a sense of purpose now to help one of his um, – one of his uh, – one of his former player or, you know, someone he mentees. helped. mentees. Well, somebody he tried to help. So, um, yeah, I, I think it'll do, I think it'll pay dividends for LSU. And I'm kind of excited about to see what kind of team LSU is going to have this year. It can't possibly be a bad thing to have a, 
a Hall of Famer as a consultant. There's no doubt oh, yeah. that. Oh, he had yep. some strong teams at Southern Cal. He had some really strong teams with the Rams. Uh, so his game, his uh, his uh, offense translated from college to the professional ranks. Uh, so, yeah, uh, I think this is a great move. Now to the stuff that's going on in and around more recent things with Southern Cal. Ben Kerchival article over at CBSSports.com. Former quality control assistant Rick Courtright says he was forced out of his job after reporting allegations, and he has now filed a lawsuit saying that he was forced from the position. And he is seeking at least $2 million in damages in the whistleblower case, which is specifically names D.C., then D.C., Clancy Pendergast. Uh, the complaint was obtained by the L.A. Times, and Courtright is alleged to have heard a conversation in which Pen Pendergast worked with then GA assistants Brett Arce and Austin Clark, to pay two USC students to take online classes for them. Courtright also claims he witnessed Pendergast handing an unspecified amount of cash to Clark, who then allegedly gave it to one of the students. RC is now as a defensive quality control analyst at USC. Clark is currently an assistant in Illinois coaching the defensive line. A report of the allegations to the compliance office June of 2017 filed an anonymous complaint with the school. And then he reported possible NCAA violations committed by grad assistants for inappropriate use of a school courtesy car, driving full-time assistant coaches while recruiting. And it goes on to state his actions resulted in retaliation against him, leading to a forced resignation in 2018. Allegations also against Clay Helton that he wouldn't be retained, barred court right from campus. USC obviously has not commented publicly on the lawsuit. Phil, it's USC. Why are we surprised? <laughs> Hey, and by no means, by no means or in any way, shape or form, are we saying the allegations are true? It no. could very well be a case of sour grapes. Yeah. But um, to go into that kind of detail about what's going on, maybe it happened. Maybe it didn't happen. Maybe some of it did. And maybe some of it didn't. But um, the mere notion that Wilkie, once again, we're bringing up something going on at Southern Cal that can be classified as a shenanigan. <laughs> that's some rough stuff man just pile on to southern cal just pile it on i mean yeah. well, i mean that that university that we're, uni oh. we're, we're wearing the pyramid of success today john wooden <laughs> UCLA. ucla yeah that very one. nice mm -hmm. um the, the university is going through so much internal stuff right now not involving athletics uh the athletic and the football program in, uh, as well as you know, trying to decide what course of action they're going to go with. Um, you know, is Clay Helton the guy? Is he not the guy? And now you got this, uh, the, the complaint about whistleblowing. Um, right now, nothing surprises me with Southern Cal. Yeah, for real. And this, this series of def dysfunctional acts that seem to going going on there at, um, at Trojan Land. One after another. Yeah. A is a bad look for Southern Cal, and it is killing the Pac-12 because that is your bell cow. And we can we could probably do a three-hour podcast on all the issues with the Pac-12, but it kind of starts with Southern Cal right now. All right, so then my question is, as a part of your midweek debriefs of programs that are trying to get back to where they once belonged to Loretta. Does this mean that you're adding Southern Cal to that list now? Well, Southern Cal has always been on the list. We just need to get, find somebody to talk about them. So I throw that to our producer, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. No pressure at all. None. Whatsoever. None. None. Um, none. Speaking of the Blue Blood series, you want to tell us a little bit about what's going on there and what you guys are looking into and what you're trying to do by talking about some of these teams in detail and in depth before we wrap up here on the first block? Since you missed the buildup that I gave you before. Yeah. We... And he's the greatest show ever on podcast, radio, and TV For as real. you freeze again. I think it's the mention of this show that makes his screen freeze. Maybe yeah. we should maybe we should talk to the toss it to the break here, John. What do you yeah. think? I think we're gonna talk to a break and we'll come back. <laughs> we'll get Wilkie to talk. <laughs> well, wait a second. Wait a second. It, there we go. Okay. We've we've teased it twice. Do it quickly before you freeze up again. Blue Blood series. What's going on? Well, I, as you know, we did a Blue Blood series with Nebraska and uh, Florida State. 
uh, a great, uh, both really good podcast. And, uh, you know, we think Lars Anderson from uh, 20 year veteran of sports illustrated and writing a book on uh, Nick Saban and bear Bryant, which we hope to have him on again to talk about. Uh, but he did a great job of kind of um, chronicling what going, went on in Nebraska post Tom Osborne and how we may have the modern era of uh, Tom Osborne in uh, Scott Frost. Hmm. Same with, um, with Florida State. Thanks for the um, reminder. I purposely kept you off that show because I knew what would happen if, John, if, if you went on one of your filibusters on FSU. But, it's called and, aneurysm. But we did bring your, our good friend Tom Block on. And he, I thought he did a great job of kind of chronicling what was going on in Tallahassee uh, during the whole Jimbo Fisher mess uh, into Willie Taggart and where it goes from there. And uh, I think Anthony Goldman, our, our esteemed co-host, um, said a few things that raised some eyebrows. And I'm sure, John, if you heard it, you were probably going, go, Anthony. <laughs> yeah, go, Anthony. But, you know, um, anytime but, AP under, any, anytime AP Goldman underscore 85 wants to rail on the past and a quitter and a guy who is seemingly uh, out of place, then I'm all for it. But Southern Cows are next target. And uh, we hope to be dropping that sometime in the near future. Uh, those are the three programs I kind of targeted as Blue Blood programs really hit some hard times. And uh, the reaction to both the podcasts have been, uh, you know, they, they blew me away. Uh, so it's good to see that the fan bases of Florida State and Nebraska are still engaged. And when they see their program up there, discussing about how to make it better they want to hear it so we appreciate those who look who uh, tuned in and uh, listened to our podcast and on that note we're going to go to break unless uh, phil the, through the beauty of radio you want to insert a promo right here from dusty Rhodes talking about hard times as we go to break so i'll leave that open to you but as we go to break we'll yes. be back yes so uh, as we go to break we'll come back on the flip side and talk about a quarterback who had one of the grossest injuries I've ever heard of that he played through for an entire season. And a and every and every guy who listens to this show or watches this show is going to cross their legs when we tell you what happened. And also, uh, somebody is kind of waving their hand in a 1AA, FCS, and they're going, hey, you know, FBS. Pick me. Pick me. We, we might be uh, heading your way. So we'll let you know who that is and what that story is. He's at Jay Wilkerson. 16. We'll give you a hint. Yeah. It's a former president. James uh, Monroe. Thomas Jefferson. George Washington. Uh, all the athletic, all the A-10 schools. Oh, but. William uh, McKinley. Yeah. Well, yes, exactly. William <laughs> McKinley. What? Yeah, John Tyler. Oh, so, McKinley owes me money. Yeah. <laughs> Millard Fillmore University is looking to go to FBS. We'll let you know who that is when we come back on the flip side. He's Jay Wilkerson, 16. He's at OSG Phil. I'm at OSG Nelson. This is at OSG Sports. On the review, we'll be back in two and two. Everybody buckle up. Bum, 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 bum. Buckle up. Let's go. Buckle up. Can we go to the store? Come on, buckle up. Ice cream? Come on, come on, come on. Everybody. Everybody buckle up. A lot goes on in the car, but you're in control. So only move when you hear the click that says they're buckled in. Never give up until they buckle up. Learn more at safercar.gov slash kidsbuckleup. A message from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Soccer Down Here is sponsored by Apolinsky & Associates, LLC. Personal injury lawyers with over 30 years of experience. Call Steve Apolinsky at 518-350-4231 or email him at steve at aa-legal.com if you need help with a wrongful death or serious injury matter. Steve Apolinsky is rated one of the top 100 trial attorneys in Georgia, recognized as legal elite by Georgia Trend Magazine for being one of the most effective lawyers in Georgia. Welcome back to The Dog Show. Up next, we have Satchmo. Satchmo is a member of the Shelter Pet Group. That's right, a group known especially for their couch snuggling, ball chasing, face licking, and of course, companionship. Now, let's see him in action. Look how he makes eye contact with his person. That's actually known as the treat stare. How intuitive, and now he appears to be excitedly turning in circles. Ah, the happy dance will come in with this group. But really, the best way to know an amazing shelter pet like Satchmo is to meet one. Visit the shelterpetproject.org today. Adopt. Brought to you by Maddie's Fund, the Humane Society of the United States, and the Ad Council. If you want to scale a mountain, 
by Boots. If you want to turn your crush into something more, say hi. At Country Financial, we know protecting the things you love and preparing for tomorrow start with simple steps. So we help you take small steps today with insurance and financial services that can have a big impact on your family's future. For all your home, auto, and life insurance needs, call Jason Wright at 678-568-6871. Pain heals. Chicks dig scars. Glory lasts forever. Right on, sir. Right on, man. Right on. Shotgun. DC right. Flip 90. Dig. On the center. On the center. Ready? <laughs> Welcome back. B Block for the OSG on CFB. And he's at Jay Wilkerson 16. He's at OSG Phil. I'm at OSG Nelson. Thanks for accessing us however you are doing so, whether it's at the online sportsguys.com for all the daily op eds that Phil wants to print. It is on Facebook at OSG Sports, Twitter at OSG Sports, Twitter on our individual accounts, and also on the OSG Sports app available iOS and Android. And YouTube, which, of course, they're watching. If they're watching here, then you're on our YouTube channel and you're watching that here as well. So, all right. So I'm going to put I'm going to put the two stories to the floor that we have that we can lead with one way or the other. Do we want to deal with bodily injury first or do we want to deal with optimism first? Let's go. Let's go happy first. OK, uh, we've been kind of smashing Yukon from pillar to post pretty much about the. Uh, Basketball going to the Big East, which really they should, and football just trying to figure out who they are right now. Just ask Randy Etzel about that. And it has created a gap because the American Athletic Conference wants nothing to do with UConn since they're in another conference with all their other sports. So there's an odd number of teams in a conference that's a go five or a, a group of five, go five as we call them here on the show. and the Millard Fillmore Rugs, sorry, I had to get that one in considering that was the last block. An ex-president, his school wants to come into FBS and perhaps be that 12th school all over again. Wilkie James Madison to the floor. And there's your former president that has the university named after him with a strong football presence. Go Dukes. Yes. Yes. In the FCS. Uh huh. And he froze up again. He froze up again. All right. So take it. So I uh, still hear you. Oh, oh my God. Still there. Yeah. Video fr- video's frozen up. So we have a still of you uh, on on the horn. Uh, there. Wait. You had it. You had it. <laughs> I mean, oh. I'm not touching anything. <laughs> All right, so Wilkie, while you're almost frozen and almost not frozen, do you want to talk about James Madison? Uh, as, he's, as, as he's frozen. Uh, Wait, no, you are. There you are. I feel like I feel like it's a bad cell signal. <laughs> <laughs> move a couple inches in one direction. Don't move from that spot. <laughs> Maybe it's the my dog's attacking me. <laughs> so we have a dog attacking Phil. We have technology attacking Wilkie. And uh, uh, so, cool. uh, I'll go and let's see if we yeah. can build a considerable strength here. Yeah. Um, we're, <laughs> we're talking about the James Madison football team, one of the more powerful teams in the football uh, championship subdivision, and a team that um, has some championship pedigree as they've won two national championships in 2004 and in 2016. And yes. they more- are a power in the FCS. They have, I don't know if they've let it be known or people around the program have let it be known. They have kind of been floating that, hey, uh, American Athletic Conference, if you want a 12th team, hey, we're right here. We fit within your geographic footprint. We wouldn't mind being a part of the whole thing. Good fit, Uh, bad fit, bad idea, good idea. Well, well, first of all, have any of you guys been to Harrisonburg, Virginia? Yes. Yes. Okay, yes, Phil, you know what I'm talking about. If you've seen their campus and you've seen their stadium, ain't no way they can do it in the American. Uh, would they would have to. Know, but I, I, I shot a football game in their stadium. I stayed across the interstate one time from JMU in Saller Stadium. And, um, you know, the, 
they would have to really invest a lot of dollars in improving that stadium and, and upping the seating capacity, facilities and all that. And I just don't know if they've got the donor base to do to do that. I mean, it, it, I think it's ambitious. I think it's way ambitious for James Madison to be to give up what they have accomplished in the FCS level and go to the American where it's not guaranteed at all if they even get in a New Year's Six Bowl. Oh. Um, so, are you obviously uh, the uh, TV money is a, um, a a big attraction? I mean, when you've got a billion dollars coming your way as a conference to distribute the next twelve years, that's that's a pretty good paycheck for a team that's probably not getting nowhere near that kind of money on the FCS level. It's just whether they can absorb the cost of the infrastructure that's going to have to take place for JMU to be able to compete in the American. In on a, in terms of a sheer talent level, they probably couldn't do much worse than what UConn's done over the past few seasons. Um, the question is, like you said, it's a resource issue, and it's an issue that we've talked about over the last few shows, I think, while you were gone. Do you want to take that step and be go from being the big dog in a smaller conference to being a very small dog in a very big um, football bowl subdivision. And right. really, realistically, you're jumping into something where you have no chance of ever winning a national championship again, if that's what your goal is. Well, I also see the fact that they're in a pretty fertile recruiting uh, oh. area there in Virginia. They can tap into uh, the Hampton Roads area and get the, the three stars, maybe a two-star, and develop them into good players. Because they've always had some good coaches there at J James Madison. Um, so they've got that going for them. I just don't know if those type of players um, would consider JMU at the uh, FBS level as they are at the FCS level, because there they can play for a, a trophy. At the F FBS level... Yeah, the, uh, getting to the American Championship game, let's be realistic. If they do come in, it's going to be at least seven to, to ten years before they can even think about going to the American title game because they're going to have to build up their talent level, and that's going to take some time. Uh, there are exceptions Especially that. in that league. Especially in that league. That is a good football league uh, mm -hmm. with some really strong teams in it. So... You know, I'll, I'll say it's good for James Madison to kind of explore the issue, but be careful what you wish for because it, it, it is a long road for them. And you've got a fan base that's already um, expecting success. And how patient will they be if you make that giant leap up? Uh, I mean, where Phil is coming from is, is – his experience with Georgia Southern, and I know that we can also add Old Dominion in this mix as an idea for a program that wanted to come from FCS to FBS. But Phil, your knowledge base specifically is coming from what Georgia Southern was and their successes on uh, in the Division One AA level with all of the championships that were there and what it's meant for them to come up to the FBS level now. And just to there, there are times where the years are lean. There are times when they're okay. And then there are times when, as a go five, you get to go to Mobile or Montgomery. Right. And that ultimately is the question, like Wilkie brought up. That's the question you have to answer and be willing to answer or have come up with a plan and willing to realize, be willing to realize that what your goal is at the end of the season may not be what it is at a lower level. Um, being able to say that you're the conference champion and you've gone to a mid-major bowl and been successful there is great. I mean, happy for you. Nothing wrong with that. But if your goal is to be a national championship level program, moving up might not necessarily be everything that you think it is. Yeah, sure, it'll bring in revenue like Wilkie talked about as, as well. But you're going to be spending more. The question is, do you want to spend more to make more? And I don't know that without doing some serious research, if they've got an answer to that question just yet. And how about the travel cost too, for JMU going to Houston? Um, I mean, I, they've got to take that into account as well. Um, so financially, you know, it, it'll be a tough road to hoe 
competitive wise, it's a good seven years. And that's, that's, you know, that's, I think it's going to be like 10 years before JMU can build a talent level in football uh, for this to pay dividends. So is it worth the risk? Required reading on that topic is twofold. Brian Fisher over at uh, College Football Talk over at NBCSports.com. And then the Fargo Forum newspaper in a column by Mike McFeely. And that was the genesis of uh, the, the most recent push in this idea where he went back and forth with uh, JMU and got a, an email response from an athletic spokesman saying that they've been fortunate to enjoy the success uh, in a wide span of sports in recent years with competitive excellence in the Colonial Athletic Association. And then our outlook on conference membership has not changed with recent events this summer. We have not received an invitation from another conference. Should an invitation be received, we'll evaluate it according to key criteria and make the best decision for James Madison University. So it's like a non-denial denial of interest. It's You're sitting there saying, well, you know, we haven't gotten an invite yet, but if somebody wanted to come and say hi, it's like we wouldn't say no. <laughs> we wouldn't, we'd, we'd, we'd open the door for them, Wilkie, if that was the case. Interesting. Um, I just... I just don't. I don't think the American really wants to expand at all. I think they're happy with eleven. I think they're happy that they got gotten rid of Jane, or uh, UConn yeah. after this year. Um, so, and let's face it, the American right now um, has some swagger, and they've just uh, had the the media rights bought up by ESPN for. Um, you know, they overpaid, in my opinion. Uh, for the American, but it's it's on the rocks, and um, it's a league that's got some swagger right now. They don't feel they need to add a 12th team, so they're not going to give it some time and see what happens. All right, so we've we've talked about good stories, we've talked about interesting stories, and now it's time for every guy in America who's going to listen to this show, or pretty much every, any guy everywhere. Bleeding scrotum. There you go. <laughs> Would you hope they never hear if you're a male? Hawaii's QB, Cole McDonald. Who was must see TV during the season last year. Yeah. Put up some tremendous numbers as a freshman. Yes, he but was. he got hit so hard in one of the games that uh, the internal injury created said two word phrase that Phil uttered at the beginning of this particular story. Say it, Phil. Say it. Bleeding scrotum. And he played through it, folks. What was he it again, Phil? Bleeding scrotum. <laughs> Threw for 3,900 yards, 36 with touchdowns with a. Bleeding scrotum. Interview in the Maui News. He confirmed that he strained his MCL in the season opener against Colorado State. Had 418 and 3 in that one. Then against San Jose State in late September, took a hit to his side that gave him uh, internal bleeding. bleeding. Um. <laughs> yes. And so, so he plays through the MCL, goes to the hospital for extra tests found out that the internal bleeding was there. He said he couldn't walk for about a week, played hurt most of the season, ending, quote, it was pretty brutal. I could imagine, yes, that it was. What was it again, oh. Phil? Yeah, that's what I want to hear. <laughs> oh, my gosh. How do you play football with a bleeding scrotum? That is going to be a drop on the remainder of this show for the rest of days. I can tell you that right now. <laughs> I, I, we should there, be laughing at his misfortune, but it's he's kind of he's okay now, and that's why Phil is laughing. <laughs> yes, um, it, it did not pro it did not keep him from playing the rest of the season, and he, cons all things considered, the kid put played pretty darn well for an upstart Hawaii program. But at the end of the day, he still had a bleeding scrotum. Thank you. <laughs> Damn. How do you how, how do you tuck and run with something like that? Oh, hey, hey, hey! 
No, hey, you're you're one to talk considering what that microphone looks like in front of you, son. Oh, oh, the but other it, that is, but re- it doesn't look like a bleeding scrotum. Correct. That is that is absolutely accurate. I'll give you that. Although it is uh, quite happy to be recording this show, I will say that much. How did he manage to get through the rest of the season without taking a shot anywhere near that? I'm hoping that he had some rather large Polynesian gentlemen protecting him for the remainder of the year. From a bleeding scrotum. And he ran to the sidelines. Yeah, uh, he pulled a Franco Harris with the Seattle Seahawks and just went that way. Went out of bounds. It's like, I'm at 45 degrees. I'm out the door. Uh, anything else? Coming? He doesn't play in the NFL. Imagine that on the injury report. Oh, it would be it would be listed like in hockey as a lower body injury. They yeah. wouldn't there would be no uh, there would be no BS. Yeah, there'd be no description of the BS going on uh, in uh, in that particular body. Anything <laughs> else come across your uh, your desks, gentlemen, before we go? Eh, not really. I mean, it's it's the middle of the college football season. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning of the show in the first block, you talked about Mr. Two Bits at Florida, a big loss for the folks down there in the Gainesville community. If you've ever been to a game there, particularly, well, I guess really George Edmondson hadn't been out there much over the last couple of seasons due to his health issues. But for the Gator fans, that was a big deal. I mean, it was nothing particularly fancy about what he did, but he and I'm not really, I don't remember the backstory right off the top of my head, how he ended up doing it, but it was a thing. He would run out into the field with the tie on, nice shirt, dress shirt, come out there, lead the team at the beginning of the fourth quarter with a two bits, four bits cheer. Everybody's got their traditions. That was the one for the Florida Gators, the Gator community in mourning for that. Yeah. Um, we feel you. Uh, love tradition in college football, and that was one of the better ones. And now they have Tom Petty uh, uh, recording of uh, I Won't Back Down between the third and fourth quarters now as a part of their traditions in Gainesville, which I thought was a very cool ad after the passing of Tom Petty. Wilkie, anything on your desk? Well, we're getting ready to start the uh, the talking season in full blown. For oh, yeah. blown. You see my Bleeding scrotum. <laughs> That is such a drama. So in a week and a half, I'll be at the ACC Media Days, or as they call um, football kickoff, the sure. SEC Media Show. Wow. Oh, you mean the one where Dabo Swinney is going to bring the, um, instead of bringing his uh, marquee players, is bringing his offensive linemen? Uh, tradition uh, to bring the old linemen. Um, yes, and I was not surprised when I got my list. But we got the SEC coming up, Big 12, Big 10, all the big conferences and, and the group of five conferences as well. And so as we get ready to do the talking season, I think it's about time that we start looking ahead to the 19 season uh, with our conference previews. And we want to go big picture next on the college football debrief. And let's Phil get us a guest for the USC show. Um, so no there you go, Phil. I'll, I'll send you a list of people. Uh, but I think we need to start looking at some big picture items for the 19 season and um, and then do our conference uh, previews. You know, here's some of that on the debrief, maybe from the three of us here in the review. So um, I think it's about time we start talking about what's going on uh, in the in the 19 season. Yeah, I think I like the countdown for the seasons run at like 40 days. Yeah. And practice. Well. August 24th is when Tom meets Leather in Florida and Miami play uh, for the Seminole War Canoe. <laughs> yeah, it's 40 some odd days. Uh, practice starts in about 20 or so days, right about the time the Talking Head Media Day se- season ends. So, yeah, there's going to be a lot more to talk about. We're inching ever so close to kickoff, gentlemen. And I think that is a show once again for the promos midweek, Wilkie and the debriefs and all of the blue blood programming. Keep an ear and an eye out for that on the OSG sports app available on iOS. Home looks like, by the way, have you ever seen um, triumph the insult insult comic dog for you to poop on (laughs) whose background (laughs) It's that microphone. Here is a segment for you to poop on. 
Oh, Wilkie, who are you wearing this week, by the way, on the TV side? The Scrappers. This was a gift from Mr. Cantor. See, there you go. And Phil is... Uh, are <laughs> what, you are you, what are you wearing, Phil? Um, I believe I'm just representing the... Um, um, the territory. Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. Territory of Puerto Rico. Okay, attaboy. So it's Scrappers, it's John Wooden, and it's a microphone for you to pop on. <laughs> Bleeding scrotum. Yeah, see, I laid out that time so it could be a drop that you could pull at any time. All right, uh, OSG Sports app, available iOS and Android anytime there's a new show. Set up your notifications, you know when we get a new show. And uh, also, if you're into soccer on the soccer side, the Soccer Down Here app, uh, 9 a.m. to 11 Eastern Time, Monday through Friday, everything soccer is on that side of the aisle. Everything else, college football, wrestling, self-help, all the other shows are on this side of the aisle. Uh, YouTube, if you're watching us and you're watching uh, Wilkie and his microphone for us to poop on, uh, on the video side on the YouTube channel, thanks for hanging out with us here at OSG Sports. OSG Sports also Facebook, Twitter, and uh, a vi uh, individual Twitters, if I could get the word out with my upper plate, at OSG Phil, J. Wilkerson 16, at OSG Nelson, uh, AP underscore Goldman 85, if I remember correctly. I don't remember where his underscore is, but I think that's where it is. So uh, all of us here on the network doing stuff, and uh, maybe we won't have shows in consecutive weeks having to deal with internal injuries, dealing with bleeding scrotum. So, bleeding scrotum. Yeah, that's just, all right, now that we've all crossed our legs for the last 15 minutes, he's Phil, he's Wilkie, I'm Nelly. Play it safe, everybody. We'll catch up with you this week. Bye. Over? Did you say over? Nothing is over until we decide it is. Was it over when the Germans